Proverbs 19.23, the fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied, he shall not be visited with evil. Now we know in the scriptural sense from all the scripture regarding the fear of God and fearing the Lord that it's it's um, to reference Him, to be in awe of Him, to give Him glory. When the Romans 1 says they glorified knowing God, they glorified Him not as God. The fear of the Lord is the opposite of that. It's to know Him and to glorify Him as God, to respect and reverence Him as God. And it doesn't completely exclude being a little bit scared of Him. He told His disciples, Fear not them that can kill the body and have no more that they can do unto thee, but fear him which hath power to kill both body and soul. And um, so it's to realize that to deal with God is is, uh, of eternal consequence. To seek his glory and not our own glory, to respect and obey what he says. If you reject the Lord's counsel, you cannot truthfully say, I fear the Lord. And we know that we can't meritoriously obey the counsel of God. In other words, when we do, even our obedience is mixed with sin. It's not, it doesn't measure up to God's standard of of holiness and goodness when we obey him in this world. But turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 7, and let's see that that inability to please God in the sense of perfect righteousness, being in sinful flesh, having a sinful nature, we can't perfectly obey God in thought, word, and deed. But that inability is... is, um, tempered with something else. Look at Romans 7, 15. Paul acknowledges that he can't obey God in that strict sense. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. He's talking about sin. Now God's given him the, uh, uh, the nature of uh, of the Lord. Christ dwelleth in us. We have his holy nature, but also a sinful nature. And so because Christ does dwell in us, we have the desire. We do hate sin, but Paul is honest about it. Even the sin that I hate, I do it. I commit it. I'm selfish. I'm proud. I'm evil. But look at what he says in verse 16. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. I can't obey the law up to God's standard of holiness, but I acknowledge that the law is right and I'm wrong. The law is good and I'm evil. It's not a problem with the law. It's a problem with me. Now then, it is no more, verse 17, now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He's not excusing himself. It's the sin that dwelleth in him is his nature. It's who he is by nature. But he's also saying in the sense that we walk not after the flesh as believers, but after the spirit. It is no more I. I'll tell you this, it's not the I that God sees that does it because he finds no iniquity in his sheep. The I that that um, Paul is talking about here is the one that God sees, the one that he has, has uh, given us, the nature that he's given us. I can, um, verse 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So, yes, clear acknowledgement that I can't obey God in, 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 in the sense of perfect 
sinless obedience to his law and therefore acceptance with him on the grounds of the law. But by his grace, I want to. By his grace, I acknowledge that his law is right. That's fearing the Lord, to reverence him as God, to take his side against us. If I'm, if I'm evil, the law is good. His God's holiness <clears throat> is not tarnished by my inability to keep it, to keep his law. And our text says that, um, and, and think about this, Paul could not, as he acknowledged here, in the strict sense of measuring up to God's law, be good, but by God's grace, he could fear God. He could acknowledge God. He could defer to God. And we're told, and that's, by the way, us also as believers. If you know the Lord, if you've believed on him, you you acknowledge that everything you do is, is sinful because of who you are, because of your nature. But you also express and, and, and truly have the desire to honor him because he's God. That's the fear that we're talking about. To respect, revere, and honor him as God. So those two can go together. We can be sinful and not be able to do anything right and yet fear God by his grace, not by nature. We'll talk about that a little bit in a minute, Lord willing. But that's us too. Now, now we're told of the very moment in which Paul began to fear God. That's very interesting. We know exactly when he started fearing God. When he met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he went in a moment from persecuting Christ. That was his life's goal, was to persecute the people of God, but the Lord said, you're persecuting me when you persecute them. But he went from that to Lord, what would you have me do in a moment? As soon as he realized who he was dealing with. And from that moment, he began to fear God by God's grace. God did a work in his heart. That's the living definition of fear. When you go about despising God, opposing God, rejecting God, hiding from God, having no interest or use for God. So Lord, I'm yours. What do you, what would you, what do you want me to do? What's your will? What's your desire? Not my will, but thine be done. Not my, not unto us be glory, but unto thy name. Give glory, O Lord, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. That's when you begin to fear God right there. And that's an act of his grace. Now our text says that this tendeth to life. And the word tendeth there is not in the original text. So it's just, it, it, it's to life. Fearing God is to life. Um, and the truth here is that the fear of the Lord is a trait. It is an attribute of those who have life. It's a quality of the new nature, which is life. The old nature is dead in trespasses and sins, but we're alive. Now we're dead to sin and alive unto God. And that is a quality of the fear. The fear of the Lord is a quality of that. And you might think, well, you know, people that hate God, they're alive too. No, they're not. No, they're not. They just think they are. In the truest sense, the sense in which it matters, they're dead. Paul said in the very context of where we read in Romans 7, who shall deliver me? Who shall save me from the body of this death? By nature, we're dead in trespasses and sins, and those that don't know God have no life. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. To have not life means to be dead. So if you have no fear of God before your eyes, you're dead while you walk. You're dead while you live. The fear of the Lord is to eternal life, which also is what matters. 
It's the same life that's in us now. The life of God is eternal. When this flesh dies and, and the old nature dies with it and perishes with it because flesh and blood and can't inherit the kingdom of God and neither can corruptible put on incorruption. But that life of God in us is eternal. And it's not just that it has no end, that it'll never cease, that like our physical life comes to an end. But this life, it's, 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 it's endless, but it's more than that. It's, it's, it's beyond. It's altogether different than physical life. It's true life. It's abundant life. And this is the only life that matters. If we in this life only have hope, we're of all men most miserable. The fearing of the Lord is a sign of spiritual life. It's to that. It's unto that. Now, I can't look at you and tell whether you're alive or dead. You may. There may be some dead people sitting in here this morning in the spiritual truth sense of the word but if you fear the lord or if you don't fear the lord you can't hide that you can't hide that it's a sign of spiritual life and that spiritual life is christ that liveth in me paul said i live yet not i but christ that liveth in me that's life eternal to have Christ living in you and to be in his good time glorified and made exactly like him, to have him change our vile bodies and fashion them like unto his glorious body. John seventeen three, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. It's just knowing God. Those who know God fear God. If you don't fear him, if you don't reverence him, if you don't obey him, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Again, not perfectly. We can't do it in this flesh. In this flesh dwelleth no good thing. And because of that, even there, what, what the Lord calls good works that we do are not meritorious. They don't, they're not acceptable in the sight of God. Christ is our acceptance in the sight of God. You are accepted in the beloved, the scripture says. That's the only way we're accepted. But those who have life, they fear God. They reverence God. And this fear is not natural to man. Turn with me to Psalm 36, please. I want to read you a, a contrast here and of what we are by nature and the remedy for it is found in Psalm 36, 1. Psalm 36, 1. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. We're all the wicked, sinful by nature. There's none righteous, no, not one. And so we are that those wicked ones, and there's no fear by nature. There's no fear of God before our eyes. And and notice here in verse two and and um, three how that that's where it starts. It's a lack of fear of God. It's a lack of reverence, a, a lack of acknowledging Him and glorifying Him and bowing to Him, leads to all this man all manner of evil as described here for. Verse 2, he flattereth himself in his own eyes. Every time, it's reciprocal. The less you think of God, the more you think of you. And vice versa. The more you think of yourself, you flatter yourself in your own eyes. We are masters at justifying ourselves blaming Satan or society or whatever. 
grew up in you know with the wrong crowd no you are the wrong crowd you were and you are the wrong crowd we flatter ourselves in our own eyes and that's that's a re direct result a reciprocal result of not fearing god not not reverencing god you're going to reverence yourself until his iniquity be found to be hateful Unless and until God shows you the exceeding sinfulness of sin, as Paul describes when he learned, when, when the Lord revealed the law in his own standing before the law, he said sin was exceeding sinful. Verse 3, the words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. <laughs> he's dumb and he's evil on purpose. He hath left off. He hath rejected that. The hope of that. The source of that. Verse 4, he deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. Instead of laying there in his bed, thanking God for all that he's done for him and, and asking the Lord to, to be merciful and to try to reckon up before God all the blessings he's bestowed upon us. By nature, we lay on our beds thinking up evil stuff to do, defying God in our hearts. He hath setteth himself. You see the deliberateness of that? And that's apart from God's grace. We deliberately set ourselves in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. You remember what the Lord said about Job? He fears me and he hates evil. <laughs> not by nature he don't. He didn't, he didn't uh, develop that virtue. That's the grace of God. That's Christ dwelling in a sinner. But look at verse 5. What's the remedy to all that? Thy mercy. Thy mercy. What we need is mercy. A, a sinner like that now, the way religion describes a sinner, well, you know, you have this disease that you were born with, and poor you, and the, you know, you're a victim. And, and no, 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 no. You're the devil is what you are by nature, deliberately. Despicable and horrible and a monster. And what we need is mercy, not a chance. We don't, need to, we don't need to make a decision. We need God to decide to have mercy on us. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. You got to be born from up there, born from above. Born again means born from above is what, what the original language there is in John 3. Thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments or a great deep. You see the contrast? Our judgments are evil. We lay in bed thinking the right thing to do is evil. But God's judgments are a great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings because of his mercy not because of any inherent goodness in any of us. Our text says also that he that feareth God shall abide satisfied. The fear of the Lord tendeth to or is to a satisfied life. That doesn't mean that, that he's going to be financially wealthy, but you know that's what religion promises. If you, you know, plant the seeds and all that, this is more than earthly increase. It doesn't mean that he's going to be satisfied in that sense with all the good things, you know, that the world has to offer. He may or may not be. But he will be content with whatever his lot in life is. He will be satisfied. Jacob said, or Esau said, I have enough. And Jacob 
wanted to give him that great gift. He said, I have enough to keep your gift. He said, no, you take this because I have everything. I have everything. And he wasn't talking about the stuff. He was talking about the Savior. So this is more than earthly increase. Um, I'll, I'll have you turn there, but we're almost we're out, out of time. So listen to Psalm 4.4. 4. This, this is a parallel to our text. You think about what our text says. They, the fear of the Lord is to life, satisfaction, and protection is the last part that we'll look at. But listen to that in Psalm 4.4. 4. Stand in awe and sin not. That word awe, stand in awe there means tremble. Fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life and to satisfaction and to safety. Next verse, Psalm 4, 5. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There be many that say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. That's good. That's what's good. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. What makes this world happy? Oh man, my crop was incredible this year. Back then, that was money. That's what they had. Wine, they'd make wine and sell it. They'd cultivate the land and that was increase. Their livestock and their produce and they, boy, that's what makes the world happy. They, you know, earthly gain. David said, this is more than that. You put gladness in my heart that's so far beyond that. Satisfaction. It tendeth, those that fear the Lord will abide satisfied. Verse eight of that psalm. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep for thou Lord only makest me dwell in safety. That's our text too. He shall not be visited with evil. But let's talk about the satisfaction part. So the fear of the Lord will cause a man to say with Paul, he, he said in, to the church at Philippi, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. And not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can suffer, I can prosper. But my happiness doesn't depend on either. Our gladness, what puts gladness in our hearts is the Savior, Christ, which strengtheneth us. I don't rejoice and I'm not strengthened by the fact that I gain earthly prominence or prosperity. I'm gladdened and strengthened by my Savior. Content because whatever the Lord ordains for me and provides for me is right. And it's enough. And it's for my good. And then that last phrase, he will not be visited with evil. And that doesn't mean nothing bad is going to happen to you. Look at, look at the Lord's people in Scripture. It doesn't mean that bad stuff will not happen to you. In the sense that we consider things bad, such as sorrows, afflictions, loss, heartache. But what this does mean, he will not be visited with evil. It's that even the bad stuff is good and not evil when it is the Lord which has ordained it and he has ordained it for our eternal good. No evil can happen to you because even if what, something that we call bad happens, it wasn't bad. 
It was good. David said in Psalm 119.71, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. You see, you can read the Bible and know the Bible like the Pharisees did, upside down and in and out. They had this head knowledge of the scriptures. But until you experience what you know up here, it is good for me that I've been afflicted. It's good for me that I've, it's been proven to me. I've lived the fact that Christ is enough. I've lived the fact that I can sing even when I'm in the prison and I'm going to be executed the next day. I've lived it. Now I know what God said. Now I know what he said. When it's not just a doctrine to me, but it's reality. And I live in the conscious reality of what God said. Psalm 119.75, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. That's a beautiful verse there in that same psalm, by the way, just a few verses down, Psalm 119. But he acknowledges that it is the Lord that afflicted him. <laughs> My children didn't enjoy getting spanked. But it was somebody that loved them with all of his heart that did it. And it wasn't a bad thing. They thought it was. <laughs> they might have they might have seen it that way. I'm sure they did. But that was a good thing. That's how our sufferings are in this world. The God who hath loved us with an everlasting love, and when he chastens and afflicts, he dealeth with you as with children. Mm. What a comforting truth. He is fa in faithfulness, he, afflict, he afflicts me. In faithfulness to his covenant, his promises unto me. Remember when the when bad things happen and, and it seems like they happen all at once, doesn't it? Sometimes it's overwhelming. When it rains, it pours. But remember our Lord's sweet promise. He says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. You may not know it, but he said, I know it. I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. There shall no evil come to those that fear the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. The expected, foreordained, and promised end of the believer is that we are predestinated to be conformed to the image of God's Son. To be like Him, and to be with him. Those that fear God have life. They're satisfied. And they're under the wing of the Almighty. Safe though the worlds may crumble. Amen. Let's thank you.